Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, it is my honor to call upon His Excellency Musa Faki Muhammad, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, to deliver his statement. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, the theme of the general meetings focus on uh, the financing of climate change and blue economy, which is only a, a part of, of the major uh, needs uh, for the financing of Africa, which has been clearly stated and uh, put, laid down uh, in Monterey in 2002, and this uh, obviously has been recurring. Doha in 2008, Dakar in 2023, going through Addis Ababa in 2015, and Paris in 2021. The issue has become a fashion. The, with the fashion, in fact, uh, they come in waves and uh, is anticipated in time. Is it not high time that we ask ourselves the simple and fatal question, what have we done with all the decisions that we have adopted in all these fora? What uh, do the indicators uh, that we see in African economies uh, tell us uh, and uh, the debt which is ever rising, what is the result uh, that is the low attractiveness uh, of our external funding? What, in fact, can we do about the mobilizing domestic na at, the, at the national level? And then experts are telling us uh, that it is stagnating if it is not uh, regressing. Mr. Chairman, I think that maybe the questions I'm raising are a bit bitter and maybe sarcastic, but this is not to be discouraged or to be pessimistic. I simply want to express here in Shammar Sheikh uh, the ardent wish that this uh, conference not be just another conference on financing, which is always deferred for Africa. I believe that the financing is, should be an endogenous process, as Agenda 2063 is uh, stating. That is, Africa should find its capacity to become relatively autonomous and to ensure the financing of its own development. I am not an expert in these technical issues. However, I cannot uh, help uh, express my reservations on the limitations of the financing of development. Uh, uh, just limiting it to monetary and uh, aspects. Uh, I'm wondering whether we should not look at realities in the eyes in order to look at it holistically. That is, are the outcome of the reforms, institutional reforms, and which, in fact, should be in the medium and long term. And also to stress the limitations and propose alternatives that could be adjusted to the logic of a partnership, a win-win partnership. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I want to refer now to the theme of this general meeting, that is the financing of climate change and the green growth. I want to first uh, congratulate the president of the group, uh, Dr. Asina, for choosing this theme, which, as I said earlier on, uh, which is a burning issue and uh, which, obviously, with the effects of climate change, which have been devastating Africa, particularly in, on the continent. Since 1970, Africa has been affected by floods and uh, drought uh, recurrently and successively. And this has led to 0.4 or 0.7 percent of the GDP. And as you're aware, that the needs uh, for financing of Africa, which is li linked uh, to adaptation to climate change and also to its mitigation. We need uh, to know that this will be on the increase. The consequence is that there is need uh, to find appropriate financing in order to implement the African Common Position, which is presented and debated uh, at the recent uh, negotiations of COP27 here in Sharm el Sheikh. Looking at the deterioration of public finance uh, and the, cons the constraint of financing will depend on honoring the commitments by, made by the international community and also that Africa, what Africa has to do 
in order to have access uh, to financing and also to countries which have complicated the structures in an, a very competitive uh, atmosphere. In fact, uh, the capacity to attract external financing and on this call, our member states are facing the obligation of having the risk of financing and then to bring about adequate institutional reforms where we have to banish all forms of distortion that take and assume various shapes and models of corruption, the embezzlement of public governance, fictitious uh, and uh, inappropriate fiscal brackets uh, and other illicit trade and all. Without ushering in a new era of transparency and anti-corruption, the business climate will remain amorphous, gray, and uh, not effective. You know, and uh, better than me, that Africa is unfairly labeled as a risk area. Very often it is at the lower rung of the ladder. And uh, this encourages, uh, discourages uh, external and, uh, f uh, investors. Given the complex nature and the subjectivity of the issue, your deliberation should uh, lead us to positions uh, that will facilitate uh, the removal of financial constraints that in fact fetter Africa's development. Macroeconomic indicators are not improving in Africa in spite of our government's efforts to support vulnerable populations uh, during this period of crisis. Average growth of African GDP has slowed from 4.8% in 2021 to 3.8% in 2022. Alongside this, 14 percent in 2022, in other words, the highest in Africa for over a decade. This inflation rate is due to the repercussions of the Ukraine war, the hike of food and energy prices, and also persistent difficulties in the world. production chains. Our socioeconomic tissue is being impacted by this cr crisis, health crisis, the climate crisis, the climate of conflict in Europe and also on our continent. This risks undermining Africa's ability to honor its commitments with a view to attaining the SDGs of the United Nations and reaching out to uh, make good on the 2063 agenda goals. I hope that this topic focusing on mobilizing private sector financing for climate and green growth in Africa will allow us to focus on the impact of climate change on our continent impacts we are all aware of. This requires significant resources to support the countries most exposed, helping them to limit risks, shore up their resilience, and manage these challenges. The hike in temperature, heat waves, massive flooding, tropical cyclones, prolonged drought, and the rise in sea levels represents a loss of human life, material damage, and population displacement undermining Africa's development. I have to say that I understand this well. I live in an island nation, a developing country that is exposed to all of these phenomena. But it is possible to transform the challenges we face into opportunities for green economic growth if we bring our private sector on board. African economy will require 
mobilization of existing resources and the harnessing of the potential in the private sector. And therefore, it is important to encourage and to facilitate private sector investment in Africa, creating conditions that will allow for crowding in of investment, conditions such as political stability, promotion of peace, protection of property rights, strengthening of our a favorable regulatory framework, um, a framework that will be favorable to adequate infrastructures. Most of our countries have ratified the African continental free trade area, which is a real opportunity for our SMEs that represent around 80% of all companies in Africa, an important lever for economic growth on the continent. Thanks to the AFCFTA, companies will be able to act across Africa and help add value and promote prosperity on our continent. Furthermore, Bilateral and multilateral financial institutions should also contribute to this economic growth, providing mechanisms that are innovative, that will help finance uh, green growth. The African Union, as a member of the G20, is fundamental. We need advocacy that will lead to Af the African Union joining the G20 at the next summit. I would like to encourage the African Development Bank and all financial institutions to walk hand in hand with the African private sector, helping them with the resources required to promote green growth. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, at the G7 summit, which has just concluded in Hiroshima, Japan, I left an appeal to the G7 countries. I asked that they listen to the AU's request for special drawing rights for Africa. Today, more than ever, we need to have more urgent financing. We need to allocate SDRs to multilateral development banks. This is the time and place as chairman of the African Union to second the appeal of the UN Secretary General. We need to automatically in times of crisis have special drawing right mechanism for the IMF that will allow us to channel these funds to the most needy countries and complemented with the support of multilateral development banks. So we need hybrid capital, new structures formulated by the African Development Bank to point us in the right direction, reduce access costs. Multilater multilateral development banks should facilitate access to capitals and help leverage the finance required for companies, for countries to go to the market. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, problem uh, of uh, climate change and all consequ negative consequences is not limited to a state uh, or to a certain region. It is an existential uh, issue that uh, should be uh, heading of all the pr development priorities of all countries in the world. And contrary to what is thought, the negative uh, impacts uh, is uh, uh, aggravated uh, to uh, less developed countries, which is very clear in the African continent. As such, uh, consequences uh, uh, are increasing uh, the levels of drought and uh, desertification and the uh, decrease of agriculture yields. Uh, the uh, indications uh, related to drought only in African countries led to losses uh, that exceed $70 billion. Uh, and in addition uh, to uh, reduce uh, agricultural production by uh, 
34%. The financing requirements in order to face such negative consequences of climate change are expected by $3 trillion till 2030. And we have to indicate that the the COP27 uh, had uh, uh, positive results that was uh, headed by Egypt, uh, and among them was uh, the agreement to establish a fund to uh, provide the necessary uh, finance uh, to cover the losses of uh, countries that were affected by uh, climate disasters. Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, actual uh, facts of uh, the economic uh, realities require the uh, private sector to provide more investment in order to develop the uh, environment-friendly projects and more clean energy and uh, uh, support uh, the required policies. And in this uh, sense, Egypt is giving uh, a big importance to the environmental dimension as the Egyptian government in uh, 20. 21 issued the first uh, uh, guidelines for sustainability, environmental sustainability under the name of the strategic uh, framework for uh, green uh, recovery with all the indications in order to uh, inc uh, streamline the SDGs in the environmental uh, policies in order to inc uh, improve welfare. It is clear uh, that uh, the activities of the AFDB this year is representing uh, an exceptional opportunity to exchange uh, knowledge and, ex, uh, uh, and uh, expert opinions uh, to face uh, the consequences of uh, climate change and uh, uh, to present a clear agenda according to clear the timeline in order to determine the mechanism to face the different challenges that are faced by the African continent. Uh, in order to reach the achievement of the SDGs. Uh, uh, dear guests of Egypt, at uh, the uh, conclusion, I would like to thank you all, to welcome you, and hope for you the best uh, in this uh, version of the annual meetings uh, of the AFDB. And that I thank uh, for uh, the uh, uh, continuous efforts to support uh, the development uh, uh, projects in our continent, which uh, uh, leads us uh, to look for more uh, uh, successful cooperation with the uh, multilateral development uh, uh, banks and uh, hoping for the welfare. And may God bless you and thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this presidential dialogue on the changing global financial architecture and the role of multilateral developing banks. I'm delighted that we have several heads of state and governments, governors, ministers, heads of global financial institutions that are joining us today especially with this panel, to discuss this global issue. Just a few weeks ago, the United Nations Secretary General alerted the world that the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, are off track. If the SDGs are to be, succeed globally, they need to succeed first in Africa. We must tackle global food security, climate change, debt, health pandemic preparedness, given the experience we had in the bad one with COVID-19. In this regard, I would like to make seven points. First, global financial architecture is failing Africa and developing countries as they face multiple global challenges. The global financial architecture needs to be modified to tackle more effectively global challenges and to accelerate achievement of the sustainable development goals. Yet, with only eight years to the target date for the SDGs, the world is off track in achieving them. Basically, therefore, we can and probably we must question the ability of the global financial architecture to serve the needs of the world 
especially the needs and aspirations of developing countries, especially Africa. Before the pandemic hit, progress to achieve the SDGs was mixed and financing was falling way short. With $2.5 trillion of SDG financing gap for developing countries, Africa alone will need $1.3 trillion annually to achieve its sustainable development goal needs by 2030. In addition, Africa requires $1.4 billion a year to recover from the tapering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic effects and to rebuild the economy's bag. Today, Africa faces three major challenges, and they are continuing. I call them the three Cs, COVID, climate, and conflicts. The solution to these challenges, excellences, ladies and gentlemen, governors, is the same. So I call the three Fs, finance, finance, and finance. Yeah, the available finance available, uh, the available finance is very limited to tackle this myriad of challenges. That brings me to my second point. Global financial architecture needs to decisively tackle climate change. Climate change, as we heard in the first opening session, is devastating the economies of Africa. The continent, which accounts for only 3% in terms of historical carbon emissions, suffers disproportionately from the negative effects of climate change. The continent loses seven to $15 billion annually due to climate change, and the trajectory is that that's probably gonna to get to $50 billion by 2030. Africa will need $2.7 trillion to implement its, uh, the continent's nationally determined contributions by 2030. Yet, the global financial architecture provides only 3% of global climate finance for Africa. Africa received just about $18.3 billion annually in climate financing between 2016 and 2019. It's paltry. At current trends, the climate financing gap of $242 billion a year will remain through 2030. This will no doubt undermine Africa's efforts to support climate resilience and a just energy transition. We should make COP28, and I'm glad that the COP28 president-elect is here to be hosted by the United Arab Emirates, a defining moment for mobilizing greater private sector financing for climate change. That brings me to my third point. Global financial architecture is ill-prepared to tackle the rising debt crisis, especially in developing countries and in Africa. The global financial architecture must respond effectively to tackle the rising debt challenges of African countries. In the wake of the financial stresses posed by COVID-19, climate change, and recent conflict between Russia and Ukraine. While median public debt has declined to 65% of GDP from 68% in 2021 due to positive effects of debt relief efforts, including the debt service suspension initiative, debt levels are still higher than pre-pandemic levels of 61%. Excellencies, the structure of Africa's debt has also changed dramatically. While bilateral debt accounted, accounts for 27% of debt compared to 52% in 2000, commercial debt now accounts for 43% of total debt compared to just 20% in 2000. Therefore, the expansion and fragmentation of creditor base complicates debt resolution by the Bretton Woods institutions and also by the Paris Club. There is therefore urgent need to reform the current international financial architecture to make it fit for orderly debt restructuring. Debt resolution in Africa, especially outside of the Paris Club processes, has often been disorderly and protracted with costly economic consequences. To avoid high debt resolution costs and to limit the likelihood of debt crisis re-emerging, the international community needs to push for enhanced transparency on debt and global coordination among creditors. 
it is critical to make the G20 common framework on debt treatment work and succeed. Now, of the four African countries, Chad, Ethiopia, Zambia, and Ghana, that have so far requested debt treatment under the common framework, while some progress has been made, none has yet to complete the process to benefit from the facility. So there's a lot of work that we still have to do collectively. In my view, there is need for an, ur an urgent need to reform the global financial and debt architecture, to reduce the costs, the time, and the legal complications of debt restructuring for African countries. Brings me to my fourth point. Global contingency financing is not working well for Africa. Think of the following. The special drawing rights issued by the International Monetary Fund has provided, of course, significant resources to help countries to deal with their ever-shrinking fiscal space. But of the $650 billion of SDRs issued, Africa got only $33 billion, and that's roughly about 4.5%. The African Union, as you heard, has called for the reallocation of about $100 billion of SDRs to Africa, with a portion of that going through the African Development Bank as the chairman of the African Union, um, President Asali said, because the African Development Bank is a prescribed holder of SDRs. The African Development Bank has been spearheading the call for SDR rechallenging by developing, developed countries to multilateral development banks. And why? The multilateral development banks can leverage. The key operative word is leverage, the SDRs. The bank can leverage it by a factor of three to four times. Now, by doing so, it will also allow us to provide greater financing to regional and national development banks all across Africa as part of the alliance we have, which is called Finance in Common, to accelerate achievement of the SDGs. And I saw my brother, Remy Rio, here, uh, the president, uh, CEO of Agence Francaise de Development. I thank you very much for the leadership that you're providing on the Finance in Common. I am delighted that the innovative model of rechanneling SDRs to multilateral development banks developed by the African Development Bank, working in collaboration with international, the Inter-American Development Bank, has now been determined by the International Monetary Fund staff to meet the critical criteria, which is the reserve asset status quality for the SDRs, because without that, you can't really do a reallocation or rechanneling. Now, what this means is the SDR donor countries can now channel their SDRs through the African Development Bank and other multilateral development banks and still count them as reserves. This is indeed highly transformational and will be a game changer for Africa at no cost to taxpayers in SDR donor countries. Now, what we now need is to move forward. We need to have five lead donors countries to form a group to provide SDRs through the African Development Bank. And I want to thank the International Monetary Fund for its close partnership and support with us on this. Please, let's do that because we have to work together a lot. It brings me to my fifth point. The current financial instruments are far from able to leverage the resources to tackle development challenges and calls for a change in the business models of multilateral financial institutions. And I always said people that I applaud Secretary Yellen for her board call for this, that we need to change our business models because we are dealing with massive issues and therefore we can't put new wine in old wine skin. The reality is that the global pension funds and institutional investors have over $145 trillion of assets under management. The global financial architecture should focus more on how to tap into these massive resources. This will require significant changes in their business models, including ourselves as multilateral financial institutions, to deploy more risk guarantee facilities, expand the use of synthetic securitization to leverage their balance sheets, and transfer some of their assets on their sovereign and non-sovereign books to the private sector to free up more space for additional lending. 
the African Development Bank has been leading globally in spearheading innovative approaches to stretch its balance sheet. Many of the recommendations of the G20 Capital Adequacy Report are already been implemented by the bank well before they were recommended. The African Development Bank, together with the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, implemented the first exposure exchange between multilateral development banks, which freed up $100 billion of additional lending room for us as a bank. Just tells you the power what we can do when we work together. We are the first and the only multilateral development bank globally to implement a synthetic securitization program to transfer some of the portfolio on our non-sovereign books to the private sector. More importantly, the transaction brought new investors together that had never had an exposure to an African risk before to take their first credit exposure on the continent. And in 2022, with support of the United Kingdom, we concluded another groundbreaking risk transfer transaction of $2 billion for our sovereign portfolio to assist with scaling up climate finance. Once again, this is the first portfolio-based risk transfer by a multilateral development bank to be concluded on a sovereign portfolio that includes private sector investors. And in July of last year, our board of directors approved the issuance of sustainable hybrid capital, which the African Development Bank first conceived and started working on since 2021. This will be leveraged three to four times through the issuance of green, social, and sustainable bonds. It is important, therefore, to note that the African Development Bank remains the largest multilateral development bank issuer of social bonds to date. A planned sustainable hybrid capital issuance is on the horizon. In all these efforts, the African Development Bank therefore is moving beyond just project-based financing towards a portfolio-based approach and a system-wide approach for creating new asset classes for institutional investors to pool and diversify their risks. Welcome, Your Excellency, Mr. President. My sixth point, the multilateral financial architecture, for it to be more effective, there is need for greater leverage of private sector financing for development. And here, since I have our shareholders here, and many of you are the same across multilateral development banks, I want to say that asking multilateral development banks to do more should come with additional resources. There must be, of course, a strong review of capital adequacy of multilateral development banks. Expanding work to leverage private sector will consume risk capital. Yet available risk capital is extremely low. The reality is that multilateral development banks depend largely on callable capital, with only a small share of their capital being paid in capital. And we use that money very well. But this limits the effective risk capital that it can use, or they can use, to de-risk and leverage private sector financing at scale due to strict prudential limits that each and other multilateral development banks must respect to keep their crucial AAA credit ratings. There should be a significant increase in capital of multilateral development banks, but more importantly, the share of their deployable risk capital if the idea of moving from billions to trillions is to materialize. The African Investment Forum with the African Development Bank and its partner launched in 2018 has become the premier private investment platform for Africa. It attracted over $142 billion of investment interest to Africa in just four years, covering 150 projects from Africa and global private sector investors, as well as institutional investors. I'm delighted to say the Africa Investment Forum for this year will be held 8 to 10 November in Marrakech in Morocco. The Alliance for Green Infrastructure in Africa, AGEA, 
launched by the African Development Bank, Africa 50, and several partners, will also help to mobilize $10 billion of private sector financing for green infrastructure in Africa. It will contribute to G7 Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment Goal of mobilizing $600 billion for financing quality infrastructure. Seventh and my last point. Regional efforts should be promoted to tackle systemic risks in Africa with regional safety nets to address myriads of exogenous shocks to complement the global safety net of the International Monetary Fund. Excellencies, Africa is the only region of the world that does not have liquidity buffers to pre protect it against shocks. To protect Africa from future economic shocks, the African Development Bank and the African Union, with actually support of African heads of state and government, are working together to establish an African financial stability mechanism. During the 35th ordinary session of the Assembly of the African Union, heads of state and government called for the establishment of the African financial stability mechanism and directed the African Union Commission and the African Development Bank to work together with all relevant stakeholders to accelerate the operationalization of the mechanism and its growth. The African financial stability mechanism will complement, I want to be clear, the global safety nets offered by the IMF to offer liquidity support for countries in times of crisis. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we need inclusive, inclusive multilateralism with equity and fairness in representation in the Bretton Woods institutions. Achieving the reform of the global financial architecture requires that Africa's voice be strengthened, for example, on the board of the IMF, where the continent has just two seats. At the end of the day, the global financial architecture should be more responsive, inclusive, accountable, and re-engineered to support the accelerated development of the world, especially Africa. We must ensure that the priorities and challenges of Africa are on the front burner of the reforms of the global financial architecture. Africa's needs must never be forgotten. Thank you very much. With these points as context and as background, my first question goes to President Az Azali Asumani. As head of state and as chairperson of the African Union, you have a global view of Africa's needs and the huge gap between what the continent requires and the development needs compared to the financial resources available. You made the call earlier in the opening ceremony for the reallocation of the IMS SDRs, among other initiatives. Uh, my question to you, sir, is, is it a long way to Uhuru, or is Africa making progress? Okay, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I can uh, reassure you that it's a great pleasure for me to participate, not only in these annual meetings, but in this panel. And let me uh, t tell you that I'm very committed as an African member country, a member of the ADB, and I also welcome this opportunity to be in the helm and chair the African Union for 2023, and I have a very strong commitment in all areas. I, my mission is to try to accelerate a, a LFCT, and uh, we try to do our best to achieve that goal. Um, I'm well positioned to defend the ADB, not only from the standpoint of my country, this is an institution that has always been by our side in, the, in our pursuit of emergency, which we're seeking to attain by 2030. Um, this gave us the opportunity uh, to have a very good rating 
from the World Bank who have been ranked in the World Bank as uh, we moved from a list income low income countries to middle income status and uh, we've also had this uh, IMF monitoring program but it's thanks to the ADB now let me come back to your specific issue on SDRs last year we defended that is better to have this SDRs, but with an institution such as the ADB and the support it is lending to all the countries and its knowledge of the continent, it is well poised uh, to deliver. It's important. We sign papers, and it takes a long time for that to transform into reality. So. I've always pleaded, and quite frankly, when we're in Japan, in terms of, uh, uh, in my statement, I pleaded that um, the ones, the pledges that have been made, and then the subsequent pledges that ADB should be the institution through which this SDR should be channeled uh, for reallocation to African countries. So thank you very much for inviting me to this panel uh, today and tomorrow. We'll still continue to be by your side. Thank you very much, President Asumani, again for uh, expressing um, the support that you will continue to provide and have provided to the African Development Bank, as well as re-echoing the call for the reallocation of SDRs to the African Development Bank, especially given its leveraging power. My next question goes to Vice President Mpango. Uh, what urgent multilateral financial institution reforms are needed to reflect the current world order and to account for emerging issues and risks? And would you agree with the premise that it is not just enough for developing countries to have a seat at the table but also to have a meaningful voice at the same time. Well, first, um, uh, thank you, moderator. And uh, let me take this opportunity to also thank the government uh, and the people of um, the Arab Republic of Egypt for their hospitality. And thanks to the African Development Bank uh, for organizing uh, this meeting here in this beautiful uh, city of Sharm El Sheikh. Um, let me also extend to the audience very warm greetings from Her Excellency uh, Dr. Samia Sulu Hassan, the President of the United Republic of Tanzania, who wished to be here, but uh, due to other exigencies, she could not. Um, let me first um, begin my remarks with um, a rejoinder to what President Adeshina was saying. Um, indeed, the global financial architecture, I think, needs to be overhauled. Uh, it is a fact that uh, the current uh, financial architecture uh, is not delivering enough uh, finances, uh, enough uh, technical support uh, to Africa and indeed most other developing countries. Um, and therefore, um, what, is, what has changed? The, the world order that was crafted way back in the mid-40s is very different from the world we live in today. Uh, first, we had the collapse of the colonial uh, era and the emergence of new nations. So they were simply not on the table uh, at, that, at that time. We also have new emerging powers now. Uh, we started with the Southeast Asian countries and then came the BRICS, and now some of the uh, Middle, uh, Middle East uh, countries. 
but we also have a, a, a different scenario altogether in terms of population and population dynamics. Um, when the Bretton Woods institutions were uh, established, the population of um, Europe and North America combined uh, basically was around 711 million people. Uh, whereas uh, for Africa, we were about 227 million. Now things have changed. The population of Africa has actually exceeded the population of uh, North America uh, and Europe combined. Um, and therefore, uh, we have to revisit the financial architecture to reflect uh, this, uh, this change. Uh, but not only that, the agenda was different. At that time, the focus was on uh, reconstruction of after the Second World War. Uh, but now we are facing a lot more uh, challenges uh, that I'll come to uh, shortly. And therefore, even the governance structure uh, and the, the operation framework of the multilateral financial institutions was uh, crafted to handle a different set of, uh, of challenges of the time then. Uh, but even then, even after Africa was integrated into this system, what we see that Africa's voice is very marginal and even um, its representation at the management and technical levels is still uh, uh, not in line with uh, our population. Uh, but, but not only that, uh, we have now a new, completely new set of challenges facing the globe. We have environmental challenges, we have natural calamities, we have food insecurity, uh, we have pandemics, uh, the debt dynamics that we are talked about, and more recently, geopolitical tensions and even wars. So if you combine all this, these basically say we need to revisit the entire uh, architecture of the multilateral uh, financing institutions. So, but aside from that, even the vision itself was basically uh, not we, what we face uh, today. And therefore, as we st where we stand today, I think we need to review the lending terms um, and also focus on the uh, delivery of the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, this means we have to revisit the policy conditionalities of the multilateral uh, financial institutions. We have absolutely to cut down on the lengthy processes uh, entailed in getting uh, funding from these institutions. Uh, the capital base also needs to be increased to match again the huge uh, demands uh, of uh, developing countries. Um, but also, I think the multilateral financial institutions have now to venture into alternative uh, funding sources. Uh, they need to be recapitalized uh, but the current financing sources are definitely um, in highly inadequate. Uh, we need to, I think, the multilateral financial institutions, their support need also to be more and more aligned with national, uh, national priorities. Uh, if I take an example of the environment, we should target on supporting the nationally determined uh, contributions um, and of course then have less stringent requirements uh, 
like the need for accreditation, uh, standalone assessments, and so on and so forth. Um, I think it's time that the multilateral financial institutions also support homegrown uh, private sector uh, interventions. I, I think that uh, would make us, uh, I think I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Vice President Mpango. Um, in other words, it is not yet Uhuru, there's still much more to be done. I'm gonna move on next to His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Egypt, Mustafa Madbouli. As you know, the African Development Bank is the, is the leading multi, multilateral finance institution on the continent, as well as the only one that's AAA rated. In your view, how should the African Development Bank Group continue to be capitalized and empowered in order to continue playing its key leadership role in spearheading development, peace, and security in Africa in a dynamically changing global environment. Uh, from the outset, uh, allow me to uh, welcome all of uh, Egypt's guests, uh, excellencies, heads of state, um, government ministers, uh, heads of international organizations, and of course, uh, governors uh, of uh, central banks across uh, Africa. So I would like uh, as well to extend uh, my thanks uh, to the uh, president of the African Development Bank, as well as uh, all other uh, representatives of regional and international financial institutions for their support uh, in financing economic development in Africa. And particularly, if uh, I zoom in on uh, Egypt, uh, significant uh, efforts uh, have been made uh, in uh, financing economic uh, projects uh, in uh, the context of uh, climate resilience, achieving uh, climate uh, targets as well, but uh, also more broadly in uh, Africa. So um, to, to uh, uh, respond to our chairperson here and to speak from the heart, uh, as we were invited to, I would like to speak, in fact, on, on behalf of Africa, if you'll allow me, and uh, really to uh, the uh, world map uh, was redesigned as uh, the uh, Vice President for Tanzania just said, so it was redesigned uh, during uh, the course of last uh, century. And uh, Africa was, within this uh, context, viewed uh, uh, only as a source of uh, primary uh, resources, uh, commodities uh, that uh, would enable uh, other parts of the world uh, to develop technologies and to uh, um, develop uh, projects uh, that uh, have yielded prosperity to their countries. The perspective on uh, or the perception of uh, Africa, uh, however, remained as only a source uh, of uh, uh, primary uh, commodities uh, and with very little added uh, value. Well, and there wasn't really a change in the mind set uh, to in Africa to, uh, to, to see that uh, uh, Africa uh, would need to uh, develop itself to provide uh, uh, the conditions for prosperity for its population, uh, which uh, currently exceeds uh, more than 1 billion, 1.4 billion uh, people. And it seems that this uh, perception still prevails. But I think that uh, given the very uh, swift changes that we are seeing uh, currently in the challenges that uh, the globe is uh, facing as a whole, and particularly Africa, we find ourselves in a situation where we need to review uh, this uh, uh, system or this uh, model. Africa should not only be a, 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 um, a, a reserve or res uh, a source uh, of uh, resources uh, only, but also a contributor to uh, development uh, and an active agent uh, in growth. And this is uh, crucially important in terms of uh, achieving uh, fairness in development. So this is, I think, a challenge uh, that uh, Africa is still facing. 
given uh, the uh, uh, recent uh, challenges and crises which we did not uh, uh, provoke, in fact, uh, COVID-19, climate uh, change, uh, geostrategic uh, 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 tensions with the and their implications uh, for Africa uh, have all uh, severely impacted uh, Africa. Africa, in fact, uh, pays a very heavy price uh, for all of these. Uh, it has been uh, attempting uh, to uh, address uh, the gaps uh, that uh, uh, we are suffering uh, from. We hope to be able, in fact, to bridge these uh, uh, gaps and uh, to enter markets which uh, are, uh, in fact, uh, uh, um, set out very stringent uh, criteria. And uh, so we find ourselves in uh, Africa in uh, a cycle of crises, of debt, and uh, this leads uh, to downgrades uh, in uh, the, the credit ratings of African countries. And so so with the higher risk countries uh, uh, are those that are faced with even harsher conditions than those uh, uh, from other parts of uh, the world. And this is why Africa is stuck in a cycle where it's not able to develop. I think it is high time for the world as a whole to uh, see Africa as a priority in uh, the uh, period, let's say, in the decade or two to come uh, when it uh, uh, comes to development projects. We've heard uh, from the uh, opening statements uh, in, the, in the previous uh, ceremony that uh, uh, Africa requires huge amounts of financing to uh, achieve uh, development goals. Three trillion dollars uh, in order to uh, also contend with climate change uh, impacts and to achieve uh, SDGs in the, oh, in the next uh, few years, uh, not to, to mention the needs in terms of uh, infrastructure uh, investment and financing. So this leads me to the role of the African Development Bank. And I think that uh, all African uh, countries uh, see the bank um, as uh, a, a very strong defender of uh, uh, of Africa and a driver of uh, uh, growth and development. However, of course, we need to uh, clearly understand that it cannot work alone. One single institution cannot finance all of Africa's needs. The uh, wonderful uh, uh, opportunities, the wonderful uh, capacities that the bank uh, provides uh, can serve uh, as uh, a leverage point, as a springboard uh, for cooperation with other partners uh, to to uh, craft new initiatives to serve uh, Africa. And I think that uh, the uh, the successful model that uh, President Adeshina mentioned in his opening uh, statement, that is to say that the bank can uh, um, provide guarantees uh, for financing. He mentioned uh, the uh, guarantees uh, that are provided uh, uh, for, in the case of uh, Egypt, uh, for uh, the Panda bonds. So this is an excellent model. The bank can also be uh, pivotal in supporting national initiatives uh, in Africa in their uh, um, efforts to implement uh, and to reach rather SDGs. So uh, this is a model, in fact, that uh, we started implementing here following COP27. Uh, that is to say, uh, the new focus uh, on water, uh, food, and uh, energy sector uh, projects. The bank, uh, the African Development Bank has helped Egypt identify and find the resources necessary for these projects. And I think this is a successful model. These types of initiatives, these types of models uh, can be expanded uh, to regions and to the whole continent. So as we move forward, the role of the bank, I think, will be crucially important in helping African countries to meet some of their needs in terms of concessional uh, uh, loans, working with other uh, financial institutions institutions and in helping uh, countries uh, in Africa to achieve uh, SDGs uh, as well as uh, help uh, uh, them achieve uh, uh, development that's uh, um, uh, climate resilient. To wrap up, I think I would say that African countries must be realistic uh, in uh, seeing that their success and their uh, progress will uh, be contingent on reliance on one another. And whatever 
Africa achieves uh, in terms of self-sufficiency, uh, trade self-sufficiency in, in services, in uh, goods, in infrastructure, uh, will be uh, 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 crucially important in terms of achieving SDGs instead of always uh, relying or strictly or only re relying on MDBs or on uh, financing sources. Uh, so of course, this is uh, crucially important, but it's important for African countries uh, to work together in order to achieve SDGs for uh, their populations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Madbouli, uh, you've given us a lot there, a lot to unpack. Um, among some of your key points, Africa should not just be a provider of resources, but an active change agent. Um, and development should be uh, seen, especially in the context of serial global crisis and the need for a change in perspective on Africa is needed. Finally, Africa's success should be based on collaborative reliance on one another. That being said, I'm going to come now to Prime Minister Ngirente of Rwanda. Following up on Prime Minister Madbuli's comment that not one institution can meet all the needs to your mind, what capacities and actions are therefore needed or required to ensure that the African Development Bank is better able to support other multilateral arrangements that empower, again, other national and regional institutions to in turn effectively respond to emerging challenges? Thank you. Thank you so much, moderator. Uh, and I think uh, everything has been said by uh, the previous speakers, but uh, I want to say something. Uh, uh, we need to know that we're living in a, in a world where we have uh, competing uh, needs. And as you know, every country in Africa has its development plan, which was set before and um, uh, sometimes aligned with the SDGs. But now we're suffering from some external shocks uh, over which we don't have a control. So it means your development uh, financing you have as a country, you have to share into two different parts. One, to achieve your development goals set before, and then also the other part to be uh, used for, you know, uh, fighting and fixing those issues coming from external shocks. And that is a, a serious issue for us. Uh, when you are asking me what, we, what is required, what's needed to be done, I think all African countries and all African leaders will know what to do. The issue now is to how do we uh, translate all those ideas into actions. And that's, this is what we need to do. And um, in terms of financing, what's needed is, of course, to increase our banks, African development banks, muscle, financial muscles, so that it can finance all, not all, but a big part of our development challenges. That's one. Uh, but uh, what I want to say is that uh, increasing that financial muscle it means also as African countries, as developing countries, we need also, we need concessional financing because, of course, we want to go to market, of course, but also we, need, we, we still need that financial, uh, I mean, that concessional financing. And for that, I think uh, I should congratulate uh, IFDB uh, with uh, its leader, Desina, for a success for the ADF replenishment, which was a success. And that was something very good for this, uh, all development, developing countries in Africa. So we need really to keep mobilizing concessional funding. That's one. Second, we need to attract private investment. And as it was mentioned by the president of the SINA, to attract private capital, you need to de-risk some sectors. And the risking sectors, removing those risks, which prevent sometimes those private sectors to come in, you need public money. And that public money would come from concession of financing. So it's a chain of things, and we need to fix those issues uh, because if you want to attract private sector, you need to de-risk those risky sectors. At the risk, then we need money, and that money comes from sometimes concession of financing or, or other part of uh, public budget. So, um, and then to conclude, I want to say that uh, all African countries, as I said, uh, with those competing needs, you need to reconcile your private target in terms of, your, I mean, your, your target in terms of development with the funding to fix those external shock, shocks which are coming from, you know, f which we don't have a control over. So, 
The other thing we need as African countries is also source cooperation. So we have a capacity sometimes with our human resources, we have a capacity, but the capacity you find in one country, you may not find it in other countries. So we need to promote the South South cooperation of African countries and help each other, assist each other to achieve our development goals. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Prime Minister Irente. Very much appreciated. And we're going to come uh, right now to uh, the, the Prime Minister of Burundi uh, for the next question. Um, Prime Minister Indirako Buka, we've heard a lot. The challenges before us are great, there are many to your mind. And from your perspective, what is it that we need to do to change the situation and change it very, very quickly? Thank you, uh, distinguished moderator. At the outset, I would like uh, to uh, thank uh, the uh, people of uh, Egypt uh, for the very warm welcome uh, extended to my delegation and myself. A lot has been uh, uh, covered, but uh, as an African, I believe that uh, we need uh, to identify the needs of uh, our populations. Since uh, we are uh, discussing mobilizing private sector uh, finance, leveraging uh, this uh, uh, resource so that uh, we can, uh, can the, the private sector can contribute to our development. Uh, there are many sectors uh, that uh, are not uh, uh, invested by the private uh, uh, sector. In order to develop our economies, therefore, uh, Africans need to uh, set out what the priorities are. And to my mind, uh, that means that uh, all Africans uh, should uh, have uh, enough uh, food. Uh, if private sector, the private sector uh, could contribute to increasing uh, food production in our continent, so as to enable uh, food self-sufficiency, this uh, would be instrumental uh, in terms of our uh, development. If uh, we look at the current uh, uh, crisis between Ukraine and uh, Russia, uh, we uh, see how much of an impact it has had on uh, uh, Africans. Uh, this is because we have not prioritized the food needs of our populations. I'll be uh, relatively uh, brief and I'll uh, conclude. I believe that uh, Africa uh, should uh, really prioritize uh, agriculture. We have the labor force, we have the lands. So if we can crop these lands uh, to achieve uh, food self-sufficiency, well, that uh, will uh, enable us to achieve development uh, uh, based on our resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Indira Kabuka, um, with agriculture as a business in Africa projected to hit $1 trillion by 2030, an excellent point there. Indeed, agriculture is the new gold. We're going to move on very quickly because we started late and we're actually one and a half hours behind time, or at least more than an hour behind time. So we're going to try and wrap up this session as quickly as possible in the interest of time. But I'm going to come to Prime Minister Abdi Barry. Um, we've been talking about fragility here, the challenges that we're facing. Um, in the context of this particular dialogue, its theme, uh, Somalia is really no stranger to the devastating effects of climate change. It has suffered disproportionately, and nearly 90% of Somalians live in multidimensional poverty. As your government continues to carry out reforms, what can development finance institutions do better to support Somalia? Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, salatu salam ala Rasulullah. Awalan, Bismillah. 
Uh, thank you. First, uh, I would like uh, to extend my thanks uh, to uh, President El Sisi uh, as well as the government and people of uh, Egypt uh, for the very warm welcome extended to us. We are here in the city of peace, uh, Sharm el Sheikh. Thank you as well uh, to the African Development Bank uh, president uh, for organizing this important event. And uh, it's. Uh, uh. And I think, and I thank the distinguished members of this panel for their valuable insight. I'm in order to be seated among you today on this issue, speaking from personal experience. I came into office last year with a clear vision and practical action plan that included a six government six pillar government program that has the potential to transfer Somalia into a vibrant and prosperous nation but soon I come to re realize the most significant issues constraining Somalia's development and progress is not lack of elaborate planning, but rather the exclusion from global financing. Within the global economic environment that we live in today, Countries like Somalia, which had the misfortune of going through a period of civil war and instability, will always have a harder time to get back on the track of recovery. On the one hand, the stable nations have been able to continuously invest in their development through economic uh, domestic revenues or borrowing. On the other hand, even as we are effectively engaged in economic reform to achieve debt relief and are empowering, uh, improving our domestic revenue mobilization, public financial management, and a good governance, our growth is still stable. For the past three decades, Somalia was not only not allowed to borrow to bankroll development, we were incurring charges from non-payment of existing loans. Thank you. Under these circumstances, fragile conflict affected state like Somalia need special facilities to finance economic reforms and recovery and to be able to respond to the emerging drivers of fragility, such as climate change. And as you know, actually, Somalia witnessed for the last five years the most severe climate change which caused the most severe droughts. And now we are also suffering floods in different parts of the countries because of the climate change. I strongly believe that the African Development Bank commitment to Africa's development, deep understanding of African continent and its development challenges 
as well as it is broad network of relationship actors and across the world constitute some of the bank's comparative advantage that can be leveraged to empower national and regional institutions to effectively respond to the emerging challenges. However, the challenges that is uh, multilateral development banks need to maintain triple A rating to be able to borrow from the international markets in order to lend to member states. Balancing the needs to address fragility quickly with maintaining the triple A rating is an issue that needs consideration from all of us. Here, I would like to point out four actionable steps that might contribute to better enable the African bank development to support countries like Somalia. And um, Prime Minister, if we could actually also shorten those okay. uh, points, that would be great because again, we're running against the clock. Thank you. Four points, but very, very quickly. Thank Just you four much. points. First is the strengthening our partnership with other development partners. Second, providing policy support. Third, providing original institutions with the resource they need. And uh, finally, actually, is the, uh, with improved uh, operational uh, flexibility and adaptability. That four things, I think, can support the African Development Bank to support Somalia and the other countries uh, in Africa. Thank you very much, Prime Thank you Minister very much. Abdi Barry. Um, for somebody who came into office just a year ago, a lot of challenges to deal with. As Dr. Adishna has always said, Africa suffers disproportionately from climate change for a problem that it did not cause. And Somalia offers us a very clear example of this. For those who may be unaware of what's going on in Somalia today, there, were, there are close to two million people in Somalia who have been displaced on account of climate change. And this is one of the reasons, again, why countries like Somalia need different mechanisms to provide the support that they urgently and very much need. Again, uh, Prime Minister um, Abdi Barry, thank you very much for those comments. Again, because we're running against the clock, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to ask follow-up questions. But at this point, I'm going to ask, um, or rather introduce uh, to us again, um, someone who has a huge responsibility for coordinating the agenda and planning of one of the world's largest global events coming up this November. Dr. Sultan bin Ahmed Al Jabbar is the COP28 president designate and the UAE special envoy for climate change and minister of industry and advanced technologies for the United Arab Emirates. In these roles, he has a keen understanding of several key global challenges and innovative solutions to overcome them. Kindly give a warm welcome to Dr. Sultan bin Ahmed Al Jabbar as he provides a short five minute statement. The AFDB has been at the forefront of the evolution that is very much needed and the architecture of MDBs and IFIs. FDB prioritized sustainable industrial growth in Africa and have been able to raise, to raise its clean tech investments from 9 to 45 percent of its portfolio in only four years. That is a remarkable achievement. Excellencies, by 2050, Africa's population will grow from 1.4 to 2.5 billion people with an average age of just 19 the youngest of any region in the world. These young people have a right to a healthy, prosperous future, and there is no reason why 
they can't have it. Africa is rich in many things, but also very rich in clean energy sources, including wind, solar, hydro, and geothermal. And as such, has a huge potential for low carbon growth and sustainable socio-economic development. But one critical challenge stands in its way, and that is the lack of available, accessible, and affordable finance. And this lack of finance is putting the world's climate goals and Africa's sustainable development at real risk. Addressing this issue is one of the top priorities of the COP28 presidency. And I am very keen to work with all parties to make practical and tangible progress and to ensure that such funds are made available, accessible, and affordable. But first, we need to acknowledge some basic realities. The 54 countries of Africa have done the least to cause climate change, contributing less than 4% of global emissions. Yet they are suffering some of the worst consequences. The AFDB estimates that Africa loses up to 15% of its potential GDP as a result of climate-related impacts. At the same time, the climate finance gap is huge. When it comes to renewable energy, only 2% of the $3 trillion invested worldwide over the last 20 years have made their way to Africa. Total climate finance for Africa currently stands at around 30 billion US dollars when it needs to be at least 10 times that amount. But if we can shift the balance on climate finance to Africa, I believe this continent can become a defining force in low carbon sustainable growth. Addressing the finance gap is a top priority for the COP28 presidency and to my team. As a first step, developed nations need to live up to their historic responsibilities and they must come through with the $100 billion in climate finance they pledged over a decade ago. They are encouraging, there are encouraging signals coming from donor countries on this front, which I hope will soon be followed by real and concrete actions. Donor countries also need to double their commitment to adaptation finance by 2025 to help build Africa's resilience. But to make transformational progress, we need to shift gears in mobilizing private finance. This is where the reform of IFIs and MDBs can make a big difference by unlocking much more concessional finance, lowering risk, and attracting private capital. COP28 is exploring additional parallel mechanisms to supercharge the flow of private finance to Africa and by adopting policies and regulations that create a favorable investment climate for the private sector, African governments can build a robust pipeline of sustainable investment. Some of this, I know, is already happening in Africa. The AFDB is spearheading innovative blended public and private finance solutions to expand clean growth through Africa 50. And the UAE is leveraging over a billion dollars in investments in renewable projects across Africa through public and private partnerships. But progress is incremental. And what is needed here is big steps, transformational progress. Excellencies, mobilizing public and private finance for Africa will have game-changing results for development and climate goals. It will help deliver clean energy for the 600 million people who, have, who lack access to electricity and the almost 1 billion who lack access to clean cooking fuels. It will create new industries, new jobs, and for sure, sustainable growth. Excellencies, distinguished guests and delegates, we do believe that there is a great potential for Africa to set an example for low carbon, high growth, sustainable development. Finance is going to be a critical success factor. In fact, finance 
is the key to turn good intentions into real results. In this year of the global stock take, we need every country and every stakeholder united in solidarity on this issue alongside mitigation, adaptation, and of course, loss and damage. Addressing climate change is more than a set of numbers. It is more than meeting goals. It is about people who deserve a better future for their families. Delivering effective climate finance to Africa will help Africa develop, progress, and prosper. It will help put the world back on the right track to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. And it will enable an energy transition that leaves no one behind. And that is what we are committed to deliver at COP28. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sultan al Jaber. The world, and indeed Africa, looks forward to joining you in November in Dubai, a city-state that is constantly evolving, mastering its environment, and providing a glimpse of what is possible through the power of vision and innovation. Thank you very much again for your remarks. To our very distinguished panelists, President Asumani, Vice President Mpango, Prime Minister Madbuli, Prime Minister Ngirente, Prime Minister Indira Kobuka, and Prime Minister Hamzi Abdi Barre, as well as to Dr. Sultan bin Hamed Al Jabbar. Thank you for being on our panel today. Thank you for your great ideas, for the work that you do, and the support, the strong support that you provide the African Development Bank. We will now take a short five minute interlude to set up the stage for our next presidential dialogue and panel discussion. Enough time for you to grab your favorite um, drink, whether it be coffee or tea. I'm sure there's plenty of that around. And when we come back, our next presidential dialogue will provide reflections on what they've heard during this presidential uh, dialogue and proffer solutions to some of the issues raised. Once again, thank you to our distinguished guests and all of our visitors, thank you for your support. And um, we'll see you back in five minutes. Thank you once again. My name is Victor Ladukin. It's been a pleasure being your moderator.